This week marks the 76th anniversary of D-Day, the Allied attack on Fortress Europe. Operation Overlord was a vast and complex battle that included so many stories of bravery, and among those stories is one that's relatively well known in the United Kingdom, but not nearly so much here across the pond, about a group of British paratroopers, or paras, who took on one of the most heavily fortified objectives of June 6, 1944, despite lacking almost all of their equipment and more than three quarters of their troops. It is one of a million stories from D-Day that deserves to be remembered. Five beaches were assaulted on D-Day, with the three farthest east on the Allied left flank being assaulted by troops from Britain and Canada under the command of General Sir Miles Dempsey. The beach on the leftmost flank was codenamed Sword Beach. The approximately five miles of beach were to be assaulted by the Second Army's First Corps under the command of Lieutenant General John Crocker. The initial objective for the troops assaulting Sword Beach on D-Day was the city of Caen. An airborne operation was planned in order to facilitate the landing of the nearly 29,000 troops assaulting Sword Beach on the morning of June 6th. Codenamed Operation Tonga, the operation included some 6,500 men of the British 6th Airborne Division who were assigned multiple objectives to support the landings. Among the objectives were taking and holding bridges considered necessary for the Allied exit from the beachhead, destroying other bridges in order to deny their use by Germans who might try to reinforce the beachhead, taking several important villages, and assaulting and destroying a heavy coastal fortification called the Merville Gun Battery. The Merville Battery was a steel-reinforced concrete gun emplacement that included four casemates, each holding a heavy artillery piece that the Allies had determined were approximately 150 mm in caliber. Such guns could fire an approximately 96-pound shell a distance of up to 8 miles in range of the landing areas on Sword Beach. The guns represented a significant threat to the landing and could have caused significant casualties. The guns would also be in range to fire upon and possibly destroy the bridges that were considered vital to the Allied breakout. The guns were so important that command had decided that if they were still functioning when the landing started, then the entire operation might fail. Taking out those guns was critical, and the task was passed to some 600 paratroops of the British 3rd Parachute Division's 9th Parachute Battalion, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Terence Otway. Otway was a graduate of the Royal Military College at Sandhurst, and commissioned in the Royal Ulster Rifles in 1933. He served in the Far East, and then in India, and attended Staff College before returning to the Royal Ulster Rifles in July 1943. By then, the RUR had been converted to an airborne role. He had been appointed commander of the 9th Parachute Battalion in March 1944. One of his sergeants said of him that he had no tolerance for a fool whatsoever. You daren't make a mistake with the colonel. Otway himself described his command philosophy. I wanted to be respected, and I wanted to be considered a fair person, but I wouldn't go out of my way to gain popularity. I wanted an efficient, well-run, happy battalion, and I reckon... I had it. The British had collected good intelligence on the battery, which allowed detailed planning, but it was a daunting target. The guns were completely enclosed by casemates, with walls and roof of reinforced concrete six and a half feet thick. Two of the guns were also surrounded by earthen embankments. The whole compound was surrounded by two barbed wire fences, with a minefield in between them. The garrison was estimated to be approximately 160 men of the 1st Battery of the 716th Static Infantry Division. Aerial photographs showed the position had up to 15 to 20 gun pits, and the garrison was thought to have up to four or five machine guns and up to three 20mm dual-purpose ground and anti-aircraft guns. Otway later described the position. There was a village a few hundred yards away which might have held more German troops. There were only two sides from which we could possibly attack. On the north, there was a double apron barbed wire fence, outside which was a minefield about 30 yards deep. Outside this again was an anti-tank ditch 14 feet wide and 16 feet deep, which we assumed would be full of horrors. He concluded, Such was the nut to be cracked. As we were to land to the south of the battery, I decided to attack from the south. Bomber Command tried to destroy the position, despite it being a fairly small target for bombers, but it was well fortified. Even direct hits on the gun casemates had failed to penetrate. The bombs had destroyed some of the wire and minefield, but Otway was forced to plan under the assumption that such damage would be repaired. Otway was given an almost free hand to develop a plan. He assigned team for rallying the paratroopers at the rendezvous point, reconnoitering the position, clearing the mines and marking paths, breaching the final large wire barrier, and finally assaulting the bunkers. Additional teams were assigned to provide fire support and engage in a diversionary attack at the gate to be made with as much noise as possible. 
Finally, three gliders carrying 47 troops, three officers, and seven sappers were to attempt a coup de main, or surprise attack, landing their gliders between the bunkers and assaulting the bunkers with submachine guns and flamethrowers. That attack would require precise timing and a pinpoint landing. Special gliders would carry heavier equipment to support the attack, including six-pounder anti-tank guns, which were to be used to blow open the steel doors of the bunkers, jeeps and ladders and equipment for scaling the anti-tank ditch. The pairs would carry 120 lengths of Bangalore torpedo, tubes of explosive that could be connected together and used to destroy obstacles. The attack would be preceded by an attack by Lancaster heavy bombers, hoping the bombs would knock holes in some of the obstacles surrounding the position. It was a complex plan, made even more complex by the timing it necessitated. The guns had to be put out of commission before the landings began, around 7 a.m. If the paratroopers had not signaled their destruction by use of wireless radio and a colored mortar flare by 5.30, the cruiser HMS Arethusa was assigned to bombard the battery in a last attempt to destroy it. The para certainly did not want to still be in the area if that happened. The battalion battle report noted with characteristic British understatement, the plan was complicated and the possibilities for mishap were numerous. There the pairs went through rigorous training. One said, doing the same thing over and over again meant we could do the whole thing without thinking. Security was essential, and Otway once checked his men's discretion by sending a group of the RAF's most attractive WAFs, members of the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, into the nearby town to see if the men were being loose-lipped. It's not quite clear what all the WAFs did to test the men, but none were found to have broken security. Prior to the invasion, Otway was confident of his men's training and ability, but he was concerned about the maturity of a battalion whose average age was just 20 years old. On June 4th, the day before the invasion was scheduled, Brigadier General Stanley James Ledger Hill, commander of the 3rd Parachute Brigade, addressed the battalion. His speech concluded, Gentlemen, in spite of your excellent training and orders, do not be daunted if chaos reigns. It undoubtedly will. The words turned out to be prophetic. After a 24-hour delay due to weather, the landings were planned for June 6th. Otway and the men of the 9th got into their planes at 11.30 the night before. And after that, almost nothing went according to plan. The gliders and paratroops dropped the night before D-Day were to have been guided by radar beacons, but many of those failed. Pilots had difficulty distinguishing the landing zones, a task which became more difficult as they came under fire. Some troopers carried something called a Eureka Beacon, intended to help guide the planes following them, but many of the beacons were damaged in the drop, and others were mistakenly activated by troops who thought they were in the correct drop zone, but were actually miles away. The plan was to have the battalion drop in an area of approximately 1,900 yards by 800 yards. Instead, Otway reported, the paratroopers of the 9th ended up being dropped over an area of more than 50 square miles. The German commander, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, had had some of the fields in the area flooded in order to make any Allied landing more difficult. Some of the paras of the 9th dropped into those fields and weighted down with 80 pounds of equipment, drowned. As they tried to gather their troops, the reconnaissance team set out, only to be almost caught by the planned bombing run by the Lancaster bombers. Some 4,000 pound bombs exploded less than 200 yards from the paratroopers. Luckily, none were killed, but the bombs entirely missed their target. The barriers would not be blown apart as hoped. As precious time ticked away, Otway considered his situation. Of the 600 men of the battalion, only 150 had made it to the rendezvous point. The gliders carrying the jeeps and anti-tank guns had not arrived. Of the 120 lengths of Bangalore torpedoes that had been carried by the paras, only 20 had made it to the rendezvous point. They had a single medium machine gun, but none of their mortars. None of their sappers, their engineers, had arrived, nor did they have any mine detectors. The field ambulance section that was supposed to support them hadn't arrived. Knowing the time was of the essence, Otway knew that he couldn't delay. He recalled asking his orderly, a position that in the British Army is called a Batman. He said, what the hell am I going to do, Wilson? And the Batman replied, only thing you can do, sir. No need to ask me. And he was right. What else could I do? With just a quarter of his men and almost none of their heavy equipment, Otway led the 9th towards the Maryville gun battery. The route was made more difficult by the misplaced bombs of the Lancasters, which had blown holes up to eight and nine feet deep in the path. At the battery, the reconnaissance teams had managed to breach the first wire fence and march them past through the minefield, having to crawl ahead and search for the mines with their knives. At one point, a German party had passed within two feet of a ditch in which some of the paratroopers were crouching, but had missed them in the darkness. 
As he broke his small group into teams to take on each casemate, machine guns opened up. The Germans knew they were there. The pair's single machine gun engaged the German guns. The now very small force sent to make a diversion at the gate silenced the guns from the flank, and then a couple of gliders came over, the teams that were supposed to land at the battery and carry out the coup de main. Of the three gliders carrying these troops, one had been lost almost immediately after takeoff. The tow rope broke and the glider landed in a field in Hampshire. The other two arrived but were unable to make out any of the light or radio signals that were supposed to guide them. One had landed four miles away. Another crash landed closer, but the troops were immediately engaged by Germans who were coming to reinforce the battery. Another part of the plan had failed, but the men of the 9th had no choice but to go on. They used their Bangalore charges to blast holes in the last of the barbed wire obstacles and went on with the attack. Some men were lost to the mines, and one of the, the few officers left was disabled by a booby trap. Machine guns opened up from inside the battery, but the pairs engaged them with their Bren light machine guns. When the pairs reached the gun positions, only four attackers made it to casemate number four, they fired inside with their guns and used grenades, compelling the garrison to surrender. Outnumbered and without heavy equipment, they had managed to take the battery in less than half an hour. They held the battery, but it was now being shelled by the Germans, who would soon counterattack. The pairs used their limited supply of plastic explosive to sabotage the guns, which turned out to be smaller than intelligence had estimated, only 100 millimeters, not 150. But the group had no operable wireless sets with which to signal HMS Arethusa. What they did still have, surprisingly, was a homing pigeon, which a signal officer had successfully carried through the jump and assault. They dispatched the pigeon with news of their success and retreated before the guns of Arethusa started firing. The bird made it back and the news of their success made the evening news. As they retreated, Otway recorded that only 80 men were left on their feet, many of them wounded. The success of the men of the 9th Parachute Battalion, who took one of the most heavily fortified objectives of the initial D-Day landings in less than a half hour, despite all of their obstacles, was a testament to their training and to the leadership of Terence Otway. Otway has occasionally been criticized for having a plan that was too complex, but others argue that his plan, which had several elements that were independent, that didn't depend upon each other, was what allowed them to put together a plan that would succeed. After the paratroopers retreated, the Germans retook the battery and were able to bring two of the guns back into action, but not to good effect by that point. It's estimated that at least some hundreds of lives were saved that might have been lost had that battery been in action when the landings started. There was an additional attempt to retake the battery on June 7th by commandos, and it was repulsed with heavy losses. And the battery did not actually fall into the hands of the Allies until August when the Germans retreated from France. Otway led his much-reduced battalion onto other objectives, but because there were so few of them, they only had partial success. He was awarded the Distinguished Service Order for his command at the Battle of the Merville Gun Battery. But two days later, a nearby artillery explosion gave him a severe concussion. He was evacuated back to England and spent the rest of the war in staff positions. He retired his commission in 1948, had a successful life in the private sector, and after retirement was a tireless advocate for causes that affected soldiers and widows and advocated for better military pensions. Terence Otway, the hero of the Battle of the Merville Gun Battery, died in 2006 at the age of 92. There's now a museum to the Merville Battery where you can see the actual bunkers involved in the fight. There's a sculpture of Terence Otway there and his beret and his Distinguished Service Order Medal are on display in the museum. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.